Welcome. My name is Scotty James. I am one of the pastors here. I'm very excited. Uh, today we have a, a guest speaker next week, uh, but today we're very blessed to have a good pastor friend of mine named uh, Dom Nuncio. Dom has been a pastor in San Diego, even outside of San Diego, for I think 20 plus years. He served in multiple churches in multiple contexts, and so it's going to be a treat for us to have him share the word of God with us. A couple things about Dom that I think are interesting. One is that uh, Dominic is one of the few people, when I meet him for lunch, he's always there before me. Typically, I'm the first one there, but he's always there before me, which means one of two things. One, either he's very responsible, has a high appreciation for timeliness, or he don't ever go to work. <laughs> or option three is maybe a little, little of both, right? So he's always on time, but it was Dom who actually connected me with Pastor Matt. Uh, he sent me a text, I don't know, over a year ago and said, hey, I know you're looking for another pastor and I got a guy you should uh, consider. And so he's blessed this church in more ways than he even realizes. So it's a delight for us to have him today to preach the word of God to us. So please give a, a warm welcome to uh, Dom Nuncio. <laughs> So the truth is, I am working, <laughs> but uh, I don't look it, but I'm Hispanic, and uh, a stigma about Hispanic is you're late to everything. <laughs> my own mom was late to my wedding rehearsal uh, by an hour, and <laughs> so I had to tell my dad, hey, we're going to do the, the ceremony whether mom's here or not tomorrow, so there's just something in me. I got to be early, because, just... We pray for me right now. There's a little PTSD happening right now. <laughs> uh, so good to be with you, church. It's so beautiful to be in person and hear the church respond and worship and song. And such a pleasure to be here. And uh, if you have a Bible and paper or pixel, would you turn to Mark chapter 4, verse 35? When Scotty said, you can talk about whatever you want, sometimes that's a gift and sometimes that's terrifying. Um, but as I prayed for the church, and it was fun to hear that Matt was talking about waiting last week, um, my heart was drawn to this passage. It's a passage that is maybe familiar for most who have been in faith. If not, this is a new story for you. It's an account of Jesus doing uh, a lecture lab with his 12 disciples. He teaches all day, and then he gets into a lab session with them by inviting them into a storm that they don't know about. And so we're going to look at that this morning, and as we think about it, there's lessons from the storm this morning. Though those boys are in an actual storm, in an actual boat, trapped at sea, in this 13 by 8 mile, 150 foot deep Sea of Galilee, they're surrounded in, in a storm that um, we'll see has some pretty lasting effects on them. Uh, we may not be in that boat today, but there's certainly an emotional, a spiritual storm that's happening for these guys, and I think there's some lessons that we can learn for ourselves today. What I've come to know after 25 plus years of ministry is, uh, it's not very profound, but I'll just name it. Today, you find yourself in a storm. Uh, you just got out of a storm, or a storm is coming. It's not profound, but it's just true. If you're alive and breathing, you are in a storm, you just got out of one, and you're still catching your breath and disoriented and going, how did we ever survive that, or one is coming. And you don't have to panic, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but those three things are true. And sometimes we find ourselves in a storm because uh, of our stupidity. Raise your hand, stupid things, yeah, I've done them on steroids, so... So sometimes my stupidity leads me to find myself in a storm. Sometimes it's my own sin that leads me to be in a storm. Anybody have an amen to that? Amen. All right, good, honest people, that's good. But sometimes it's obedience where you find yourself in a storm. And we'll see with these boys is that Jesus' invitation that they find themselves in a storm. And so it's very possible for you today to find yourself in a storm, just getting out of a storm, a storm coming, 
because of just being obedient to the Lord. And so as we look at this passage, just know it's coming. You just got out of one or you're in one now. I'm going to invite you old school, if you will. Would you stand with me as we read the word of God? Out of reverence for that. It's on the screens if you don't have it. Hear this account of John Mark's writing of Jesus and the disciples. Verse 35. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. In verse 37, a furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped and Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. And the disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up and rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet, be still. And the wind died down and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. May the Lord bless the readers and hearers of his word. Amen. You may be seated. The book of Mark is different than the other gospels. Each gospel, the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they all have a a different purpose. And the book of Mark, if you've ever read it or if you're new to it, he writes at a breakneck speed. He loves the word immediately. He's just trying to get to the point as quick as he can. Where Matthew is long and loquacious and he gives all this detail, John Mark's just like, get to it already. He's God. This is what he did. He's the son of God. Immediately this, immediately that. Crowds, crowds, immediately, immediately, immediately. And for four chapters, if if I can just let you know what the disciples have been experiencing and what all of Israel has been experiencing with this polarizing figure, Jesus. John Mark starts with, the purpose of my book is to say that Jesus is the son of God. It's the first sentence that he says. Let's just get all the mystery out of the room. Jesus is the son of God. Here's how. And for four chapters, he builds on this character study that leads us to this day at sea. In chapter one, we see that he points to this man named John the Baptist, who is a forerunner who's been pre-told through scripture. And John the Baptist, his whole ministry is saying, I'm not the Messiah, but one who's coming, I'm not even able to take off his sandals. I'm not worthy to stoop down and touch the dirt and dung on his feet and take off his sandals. There's one that's coming. Prepare the way. A kingdom is coming. It's a reality. Prepare the way. And there he is. And it's Jesus. And he baptizes Jesus, and Jesus' baptism is public, and and John's torn in other accounts. You see, like, it's the role reversal. You're supposed to baptize me. I can't even touch your sandals, and you're telling me I'm supposed to baptize you. What's going on? Oh, this is the way it's to be. So he, he baptizes them, and at, at the immersion of this watery grave, Jesus comes up, and the voice of the Father says, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased, and the Holy Spirit as a dove descends and remains on him. Something totally foreign. There's an identification of the forerunner and the Father all at once to the people that are watching. And this launches Jesus' public ministry. He goes from obscurity to a public ministry. He's from Nazareth, and the saying of Nazareth is there's nothing that good comes from Nazareth. It's a little podunk place where nothing good, nobody smart, nobody worthy and eloquent comes from. And yet here's Jesus, and he launches into this public ministry. And he's moved from obscurity to ministry, then he goes and calls this motley crew of boys to come and follow him. And to be called by a rabbi is a beautiful thing. The fact that most of these men that he calls are not the most educated, they're not the cream of the crop, they didn't make the cut, 
to be called by a rabbi, they got called like every good Jewish boy. They come and learn Torah and law and they memorize it. And as they make the rank, some are called to one day eventually hear from the voice of a rabbi say, come and follow me. Instead, they heard, go back to your father's trade. You didn't make it. T-ball was cute. You didn't make the minors, let alone the majors. And so at the request of a rabbi to come and follow me, you see that the boys jump out of the boat and say, of course, the rabbi just called us. Here we come. It's a motley crew of people that they don't vote the same way. They don't think the same way. They come from different trades. And yet somehow they're the representatives of this kingdom reality and this ministry that Jesus starts. Can you see it? Doesn't it sound kind of like us? And along the way, he just rocks their world. These disciples have long held up these rabbis. They maybe had trading cards back in the day to say, did you have Rabbi Hillel's? Yeah, I got two of them. This is rookie year, here you go. And Jesus is coming and he's teaching and he's undoing the system. He, he teaches on the Sabbath and he heals on the Sabbath, which is an offense violatable by death. It's actually that moment where the, the religious leaders see Jesus doing that and say, at that moment, that's where they plot to kill Jesus. How dare he violate Shabbat? He heals the sick and diseased in Mark's account and you just see this growing population of diseased and lame and demon possessed coming to him and it's exhausting and he's healing and he's casting out demons and as demons come out, they rightly identify him as Jesus, you're the son of God and he says, shut up. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. And the disciples see this and go, what just happened? And one day he comes up to a leper, and in that society, a leper was one who had to say, unclean, 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 stay away, I'm a pariah, stay away from me, I'm shamed, I'm degraded, I'm despised by all of society because of this disease. Other rabbis would cross the street to get away from them. At times they would throw rocks just to say, get out of my presence. And Jesus with his disciples, comes to the man and has compassion on him. It's a defining trait that these young men will see Jesus doing. He has compassion on him, and he does the audacious thing of reaching his hand out to the despised and dejected, and he gets low. And, he's, and the man says, I just want to be well. If you can make me well, I, I'd love that. And with compassion, he touches him. Be well. Be healed and go about your way. Don't tell anybody. Do you know how dumb that is? <laughs> you just healed me. I can finally go to Thanksgiving dinner with family. I can finally just have a hug. And rocks aren't going to be thrown at me anymore. And people aren't going to despise me and women aren't going to cover their kids' eyes as we walk by. So he goes, Jesus saved me and healed me. It's that guy over there. Everybody go to him. He becomes the evangelist for Jesus. And at that moment, Jesus' ministry moves from little synagogues to where he can't even gather in a city anymore. Scripture says that he has to now go teach in desolate places. So he becomes a local celebrity to a national platform where people go day's journeys just to see this Jesus of Nazareth. But what good could come from Nazareth? And the disciples say, huh, that's interesting. He touched the leper. He's healing the sick. I think our scripture told us something about the Messiah doing that. I wonder when he'll come. <laughs> the crowds grow. 
when Jesus tries to come back and teach in a village. Remember now when we think of a city, we think of Santee, right, or, or, or San Diego. There's 3.3 million people in San Diego. No, these cities are 50 to 100 people. It's just a couple of families. So think about that when thousands are coming. It's like Coachella happening right now. <laughs> There's nothing happening, and then everybody's there, and then they leave the desolate place again. Coachella is happening daily for Jesus. When he comes back into a city to try and just have a meal with friends, the entire city shows up. Imagine how frightening that is for the disciples. You're just trying to get a little rest, and all of a sudden, what's that noise? Somebody's tearing the roof off of our house. So eager to get to this Jesus that they lower a, the paralyzed man in front of Jesus. And Jesus, what they come to find out, sees the need. But the actual need, the need that everyone saw was he's a paralytic and he needs to be made well. And what does Jesus say to him? Your sins are forgiven. So he's a God who, he's a, a teacher who has compassion. He has authority when he teaches. He heals the lame, the blind, the diseased, the demon possessed, call him the son of God. He does what only God can do and says, you're forgiven. He discerns the hearts and minds of the leaders without them saying anything. He goes, why are you thinking that? I see your heart's motive back there. What's easier to say sins are forgiven or go walk? Well, how about sins are forgiven and go walk? I'll do both. And all say, we've never seen anything like this. It's quite literally the greatest show on earth. And the crowds grow. And the disciples discuss amongst themselves, what is happening? We just were excited to not be fishing anymore, and collecting taxes, being a doctor, and being a zealot who wants to fight people all the time. And the crowds grow. And they grow so much that Jesus, who's now teaching around this Sea of Galilee, steps into a boat. He says, boys, secure a boat for me because I'm worried about the crowds crushing me. And from then on, Jesus finds himself teaching in a boat at the shore's distance so he can project his voice but also not be crushed by the crowds who are clamoring for just a touch and a glimpse of this teacher from Nazareth. Can you see it? And Jesus becomes a polarizing figure. He is the greatest show on earth. And some are going with genuine, heartfelt pursuit of just seeing this Jesus of Nazareth. And some are going to trap him up to figure out a way to silence this prophet, this teacher. And others are just going for the show. There's nothing else happening. Let's see what's happening. So for days' journeys, they come and gather to hear the teachings of this Jesus. And as Jesus recognizes that, he begins speaking in parable. As a way to weed out the crowd of, I don't know what you're here for, but if you're here for truth, he who has ears, let him hear. The kingdom of God is like this. It's like this. Faith is like this. You've heard it say this, but it's actually this. He who has ears, let him hear. And the disciples said, I didn't get any of that, Jesus. You, you were talking about like a seed or something. I, I don't get it. And so we'd see this pattern of Jesus bringing the boys together and saying, this is what I mean by that. And in chapter four, the morning before the evening's events on sea, we have this compassionate God who sees, who has the power to heal, who has the power to forgive sins, who is rightly identified by the Father, by the Spirit, 
by John the Baptist and even by the demons is the Son of God teaching in a boat parables. And he teaches four parables that day. And in the midst of that, he says to the boys, he says, the mysteries and the keys to the kingdom are yours. And they say, huh? (laughs) He teaches a parable. He brings them back. This is what it means. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Parable back, parable back. And at the end of this time, he's been lecturing all day and invites the disciples in for a lab and says, come with me, let's get in the boat. So verse 35, it's on that day. It took me 20 minutes to just get to that day. (laughs) A lot has happened, right? On that day when evening came. After he'd been this polarizing figure building this first year of ministry, after they're saying he's the son of Satan and that's where he gets his authority from. After he tells them you have the keys to the kingdom. Follow me, pursue me. Be healed, be sins forgiven. On that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. So verse 36, leaving the crowd behind, he took them, meaning the disciples, along just as he was in the boat. That literally just means he was teaching in the boat and he said, join me in the boat and let's go to the other side. And there were also other boats with them. Jesus, we see when his obscurity goes into public ministry, he can't get a moment alone. He goes to solitary places, and the guys come up and find him and go, oh, there you are. And he's like, yeah, I was trying to be with the Father. Can I have a minute, please? So there's boats following. The paparazzi are with them. What's Jesus up to? In verse 37, a furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Everybody say swamped. Swamped. Yeah, good. And Jesus has the audacity to be in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. We see Jesus' humanity right here. He's been teaching all day. Sometimes I'll do five services on a Sunday, and I need a nap. I take a nap. Sometimes in the afternoon before the evening services. Sometimes between the second service. I just need to be like, oh, man, there's a lot. So Jesus' humanity is revealed. He's tired. He's sleeping on a cushion, fully God, but fully man. He takes a nap on the Sea of Galilee. But a storm comes, and there's something different about this storm because the disciples wake him up. And they say to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown? There's four questions that come in this passage that we're going to look at briefly that I think when we're in storms, we all find ourselves asking. And also Jesus saying to us two questions that we'll look at. But it's got to be a pretty bad storm. Not everybody's a fisherman, but the ones that are fishermen, they know these channels, they know these waters, they've navigated them since they were little boys. The topography of of the Sea of Galilee, again, it's 13 miles, 8 miles, 150 feet deep. It's it's not a little puddle, it's not Lake Murray, It's, it's big. It's like a great lake. And the way it is, it's below sea level, and the way the design is, there's these wind storms that will come, and if you just Google when you get home, wind storm on the Sea of Galilee, you'll see today that winds can just pick up instantly, and waves start coming. And so at first, the, maybe Peter goes, I got this, he's impetuous, he's a ready, fire, aim guy. He'll cut an ear off before he knows what to do. He says, give me that oar. I got it. I've been like this one before when I was my day. And then we're not getting anywhere. And water's coming on. They're getting swamped. It's building. If you've ever been caught in a storm physically or emotionally or spiritually, you'll know you'll try your tactics and techniques to navigate that storm. Amen? 
And at some point, you find that you're woefully inept to navigate that storm. And the heart rate starts pumping. And you start looking around, and you went from calm to, hey, guys, okay, I'm kind of nervous. Oh, my gosh, are you going to help me? And they start all their tactics and techniques to navigate these channels that are totally familiar waters, but they find themselves so terrified that they have to wake the teacher who's sleeping on a cushion. They're probably elbowing each other. Which one gets to go wake him up? Wake him up. We don't know what to do. But there's something unique about this storm. It's taking their breath away, quite literally. And they're panicking. And they come and ask a question. I've asked that question myself. Maybe you are asking yourself that question today. Teacher, don't you care if we drown? Anybody asked that question before? One of the things that I love about Scotty, him and I share, uh, I don't love that we share this, but we share the loss of a sister. And in 2021, my sister went to bed and didn't wake up the next day. And the next week after that, my aunt passed away. And at the end of that week, my grandma passed away. So to lose a 43-year-old older sister for no reason. To watch my family grieve the loss of a daughter, a sister, and a mother in a two and a half week period it was a storm I'd never known. It radically changed me. I'm not the same person I was two years ago. And time after time, I tried all my tactics and techniques to navigate that storm. And I had no skill set that would get me through that. I was swamped. I was taking in water. I was drowning. Teacher, don't you care that we drown? Don't you care about my life and my family? And Why would you do this? Why would you invite me into this? I thought you were good. Why would you bring me into this storm? Just so I die here? I don't know what your storm is this morning. Maybe you're going, I don't know how our marriage is going to make it. I don't know how we're going to pay finances this week. I'm struggling with our kids. I'm struggling that we're trying to have kids and can't have kids. I'm struggling with family, with relationships, with work and neighbor. I'm struggling with mental health. I'm just not sure he's a God that cares or listens. Would you take solace in the fact that even the disciples, seeing all that they've said, they call him, first of all, notice what they say. They say, teacher. They didn't say savior or Messiah or Lord. They said teacher. They didn't even recognize who was in the boat with them. Don't you care if we drowned? And Jesus doesn't answer them. Not at least in the way that he wanted or they thought they should answer. He wakes up in verse 39. He wipes the sleep out of his eyes. That's Dominic's paraphrase. He got up and rebuked the wind and said to the waves, quiet. Be still. It's the same word that he uses when he tells the demons to shut up. Quiet, be still, and the wind dies down and it was completely calm. The Greek there is not that it just gradually calms down, it's instantaneously. It's an amazing word. He takes the breath out of wind. (gasps) Done. Not, Not for a split millisecond more did wind recap it. Just, you're done. And water, knock it off. Placid, glass, instantaneously. And the disciples who were anxious in navigating the storm are now anxious going, what the heck just happened? 
Teacher, don't you care if we drown? The storm is too much. It's intense. And you're sleeping on a stupid cushion. Could you pick up an oar, please? Quiet, be still. Um, why are you so afraid? Well, Jesus, this is a dumb question. Why are we so afraid? It's the storm. It was just here before you were... You, you missed it, you were asleep, but there was this big storm. <laughs> Why are you so afraid? It seems like your eyes were on the storm more than they were on me. Did, did you see me at any time panic or freak out? Or was I snoring on the stern? you were snoring on the stern. So maybe you should have put the oar down and picked up a cushion and laid down next to me. Maybe you need to follow the posture of a master. I'm not just a teacher. I'm so much more than that. Even the demons know I'm the son of God. The voice of the father, John Baptist, has said this. You've seen what I'm like. If I'm not freaking out, neither do you need to. Put down the oar and pick up a cushion. I said, let's go to the other side. I didn't say, let's get in a boat and drown. And you forgot the promises, that I'm the promise keeper and my, I keep my word. We'll find out that they arrive at safe passage safely to the other side, as he said. Why are you so afraid? Don't I care that you drowned? Oh, boys, you have no idea how much I care. I left my throne in heaven, surrounded by praise to come and tabernacle among you, to grow up in obscurity, to be despised and rejected by my own creation. In just a few chapters, you'll see how much to the extent that I love you. As I'm nailed to a cross by my own creation, as I'm beat and despised and not identified by who I am. I love you more than you'll ever know. Don't I care that you'll drown? I've watched you as you were knit in your mother's womb. I knew of you before the foundations of the earth. You're just discovering who I am. Do I care that you drowned more than you'll ever know? So why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? After all that you've seen me do, do you still have no faith? You have more faith that the storm will do damage than in the one who's in the boat with you. Your gaze and perspective are in the wrong place, boys. Do you still have no faith? Do you remember that day this morning when I taught on my word and the worries of the world choking out my word. You're worried about much things right now. And my promise of getting you to the other side has been choked out by the worries. It's only been two hours since I taught that lesson. Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples in verse 41, are terrified. It's a sense of awe of what's just happened and sheer panic about what's happened. Can we agree that that would be a terrifying moment? You're just trying to catch your breath on, I thought we were gonna die, and now I think this guy could kill us. <laughs> like, instantaneously. Who is this? Oh, I take great solace in that one question. I've been walking with the Lord for a long time and I'm still asking that question. Who is this? And they have the physical Jesus with them doing all these miraculous signs that I'm just trying to bring to 3D this morning from this 2D text. But they see it, the smells, the sounds, the sights. They're snuggled up with Jesus at meals and John's trying to, 
you know, say I'm the most loved or whatever. <laughs> and they still don't get it. I take a lot of comfort in that. I don't know about you. And Jesus isn't like, you idiots. You suck. Can I say suck here? I think. <laughs> I may not be invited back. We'll see. <laughs> no, he's, I love you. Why are you so afraid? I'm, I'm that good. I'll take care of you. I know you're drowning. I know it's scary. But why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Psalm 89 verse 9 says, you rule the swelling of the sea, and when its waves rise, you still them. Psalm 107.29 says, he caused the storm to be still so that the waves of the sea were hushed. There's many more, but over and over again, these good Hebrew boys would know that what just happened is something only characteristic of God doing. I thought he was teacher. He's so much more than that. I thought he did signs that were pretty cool, but he's so much more than that. I thought that maybe he just misstepped as a teacher and invited us into this sea and now we're all gonna die and the only person that we've all blamed each other while he was sleeping, but now we've all come to say, wait, how did we get here? Jesus brought us here. It must be him. Oh, he might be Messiah. He might actually just be bigger than the storm that I'm in. Oh, I think maybe our faith is misplaced. I, I was having all confidence in the natural, but the supernatural is here incarnate with me now. Who is this? Our text ends this morning. And we see that there's a lot more life and ministry. There's two more years of ministry with Jesus before the crucifixion. But a couple of things that I love about these questions are that they're so real and tangible. I love that scripture isn't trying to mince words or placate us to say, life is good, God is good all the time, all the time God's good, which is true. But sometimes it's, don't you care that I'm drowning? Are you a big enough God that I can say that to today? You said you're the good shepherd, how good are you? It doesn't feel good right now. You said you'd never leave or forsake me, but I feel so abandoned right now. Where are you? Where are you? And hear the words of Jesus this morning, whatever storm you might find yourself in. Village church, if you find yourself in a storm, maybe you just got out of a storm, or a storm is coming, would you hear Jesus say to you, why are you so afraid? It doesn't dismiss pain. It doesn't minimize what you're going through. It's just, I'm bigger than any storm you'll ever experience. And I'm a promise keeper and I'll be with you through the end of the age. And if you're walking in obedience, it's for your good, your maturation. It's creating ripple effects at the loss of, as we grieved our family and still grieve, I've been invited into a club I never wanted a membership card of. And it's allowed me to grieve with people in a new way that I never knew was possible. And all of a sudden, I saw all these people out of the woodwork in churches go, I'm there too. Is Jesus good enough? Yeah, he is. Will Jesus get us through it? Yeah. You might walk with a limp after it, but he's still good. He's still faithful. And you actually see the sweetness that he's actually right there on the boat with you when you thought he was far away. Jesus' slumber is not apathy, it's authority. He has so much authority that he can slumber in a storm because he's not scared by the storm. He commands the wind and the waves. So 
Village Church, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? As the band comes back and we're going to respond in musical worship here in a moment, I just want to use those four questions really quickly. Are you drowning this morning? Would you come to see that Jesus is with you? And if the storm is at his invitation or at your stupidity and sin, welcome to humanity. Welcome to the club. God is bigger than any storm you put yourself in or he calls you to. He is able and capable beyond any tactics you have. Why are you so afraid? Would you come to have more fear in him than in any storm that would come? Not terrified, but fear, awe, reverence, wonder of this amazing God. Do you still have no faith? Would you come today in a heart posture as we lifted our hands this morning It's not, we don't lift our hands because it rhymes with stand and command and land and sand. It's a biblical posture of worship, two Hebrew words, toda and yada. It's a a posture of surrender, it's a posture of father, pick me up. Would you come today and say, I'm terrified today, God. My faith feels so small. I surrender to you. Would you pick me up, Dad? Would you show me that you're with me? And if you ask yourself the question, who is this? Maybe for the first time you find yourself in a church this morning, you thought the building would fall down on you when you walked in. You thought all the stuff that you've done is bigger than what God can cover. Would you see that he knows you and he saw you and he thought of you? As you ask the question, who is this? You are in good company. And would you come to find out that he's the son of God this morning? that he's the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world, that he's savior and healer and teacher and deliverer all at once. He's friend, he's brother, he walks with us in all things. And if you've loved Jesus for a long time and are still asking, who is this Jesus? May you see the sweetness and goodness of Jesus in deeper and newer levels than you ever thought existed. Would you find out that he's nearer than you actually thought? For those in Christ, you are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And he's in you, the hope of glory, living his life in and through you. You can't get much more near than in. So God, this morning, we come to you. Thanks for this text. Thanks that you put this here for us so that we could just see you're a God that's compassionate and caring and loving and merciful, that you're you're patient as you were patient with the disciples who you gave all mystery and knowledge to and they still didn't get it. Thank you that that can be true of us this morning. Thank you for your word that brings life that nothing clever that I say will do what your spirit and word can do. So I pray you captivate our hearts. God, you'd bring healing, you'd bring calmness in a storm where there's anxiety that that would be displaced with calm and rest, where there's fear that that would be replaced with wonder and worship. And that you would transform our communities and our homes and our schools and our places that we live, work, and play for your glory. We ask this in your mighty and precious name. Amen. Amen. Wonderful to be with you today. Amen. One more time, let's give a big thank you to Pastor Dom, preaching the word for us. Amen. Such a good word. Like he said, if you're in the midst of a storm or coming out of a storm, that concept, don't you even care or don't you care if I drown, don't forget that thought process isn't just you. There's an unseen world that we're involved in as well. And oftentimes the enemy of our soul will seize the opportunity afforded by storms to get you to turn from God or to think to get you to start thinking inaccurately. No, God, God does care. No, God does care about me. No, God is in control of this. And so when you see your mind going that way, doesn't mean it doesn't hurt, doesn't mean it's not real, but you can't allow yourself to start believing lies. Because once you start believing lies, you're on the path to destruction. So uh, grab onto that. 
search your heart this, this, this upcoming week. Spend some time praying and, and ask God, Lord, am, am I being deceived in any way? If I'm in the midst of a storm, am I doubting your ability or am I starting to, to, to see this storm as, as bigger than you are? And ask God to reveal those things to you and then to surrender those things. Because uh, if we're going to live well, we've got we've to know who our God is. Amen? Amen. Again, if you're the first time here, welcome. We have a gift for you. Stop by the Welcome Center. Uh, go to your home groups. Review these things in home group. Unpack these things together so that we can be strengthened in our faith. And God bless you. Have a great week, and we will see you next week.